Ready. Aim. Shoot. Welcome to Arrows of Revival. God wants to use you as an arrow in his revival. And he's releasing arrows across the world for a world revival. Tune in as we discuss these arrows. Greetings. This is Bishop Reed here with my son, Tarek, who is now an evangelist. So that's Evangelist Tarek. And we're here with another episode of Arrows of Revival. And I want to talk today with my son here with us. I want to talk about um, young people in ministry, young people in ministry. And, you know, Tarek is my son. I mean, he's either not a child anymore. No, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, he's 24 years old. Yep. And uh, he's basically on his own. And But the Bible does say in Psalm 127, verse 4, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And I'm saying that to say that um, I, I am blessed by God to have a son like Tarek and my other children who God have been using in a ministry in different ways. And truly, as the scripture says, uh, children of the youth are arrows in the hand of a mighty man. And as we're talking about arrows of revival, young people are one of the arrows in revival in these last days. The Bible says in Joel 2.28, in the last days or after this, God will pour his spirit upon all flesh and sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young man shall see visions. Old man shall dream dreams. So therefore, young people are a part of the revival that is happening in these last days. And uh, just to tell you a little about uh, my son, Tarek, that he's getting ready to go to Nepal. He has been studying at the Bethel. Uh, Bethany Global University. Right. Bethany Global University. Bethany Global University has been studying there for the past two years, studying missions and business. Am I correct? Yep. And uh, he will be going to Nepal for about two years, a little less than two years. And he will be continuing his studies there while he's doing missions. He will be learning about missions while doing it in Nepal. Uh, And he'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But just to give you an idea of what he's doing now, he was just ordained in our church as an evangelist, and God has used him over the years. And so what I want to point out to you is that God can use young people. And the parents that are listening, we need to understand this, that it's great, it's awesome for your son, your daughter to become a doctor, become a lawyer, uh, to become whatever career, teacher, plumber, whatever career, uh, it, it's it's that's a very good thing. And to do great things in life, to be successful in life, that's all good, all well. But also encourage your children to do the work of ministry. For some of you, your children will be called into the ministry. Some, that is, that will be what they do full time, ministry. God is still calling young people into that. And to some even though they may have their careers, may also be active doing ministry. And, and encourage your children to go into ministry. I find that it's less than in the past their parents are encouraging their children for ministry. Uh, but we need to do that because children are arrows for God's revival. God will use children or young people in his revival in these days. And so I want to talk to Tarek, find out more about how we got into ministry. And I hopefully in this episode, it will inspire other young people listening to go into ministry themselves. But not only that, but that us as parents, we may see the need to encourage and pray for our children or uh, children that we have to go into ministry. Praise God. So, Tarek, um, it's glad to have you as a part of Arrows of Revival today. Um, so just for those that are listening and, you know, and I could hear again also. So tell us your testimony. 
And what brought you to this place in terms of doing ministry? Um, like whenever I tell my uh, testimony, I think it's um, it's always a I always start want to start at the very beginning of my testimony. And uh, when I go through it, it's always it starts with uh, my mom, um, you know, mommy, you know, your wife, you know, <laughs> um, I think uh, one of the things is that, you know, being born, I think I was born uh, premature at the time. And um, hearing my mom's testimony of uh, someone who, you know, had a child and, you know, who was on the, you know, basically was on the break and of, you know, having this child being lost because of how uh, little he was. You know, hearing her story of faith, of how she came to the faith and um, how she, you know, prayed and went to uh, other leaders to pray for my life and how, you know, the doctors didn't think it was going to happen. But, you know, seeing me being healed uh, from that, you know, there was a point in my life where, you know, I had asthma and I can be a testimony to say that, you know, since that prayer and since being healed at that time, um, I don't suffer from asthma anymore. So um, I, I think it always starts with my mom and how her faith played into my faith um, growing up. And um, I think that story's always stuck with me. So, you know, growing up, I was definitely always um, in church. Wait, but just to cut you for a moment, you know also that your mother had a revelation before you were born. She saw you being delivered and coming out preaching. Yeah. If you remember, she always tells this story. Yeah, she always does. Um, you know, she, uh, a couple of leaders in the church, while they were praying um, for me while I was in the hospital, you know, she herself, you know, she said she used to pray. Uh, there's a book in the Bible um, where a part of her book, of, I think it was like First Kings, where you have Samuel um, comes in and uh, Hannah mom is praying for Samuel. Right, actually, yeah. First Samuel. This is First Samuel. Yeah. All right. So First Samuel, you have um, Samuel right there, and you know you have Hannah's mom who's actually praying and praying. With Samuel's Samuel's mom, Hannah. Yeah, Hannah, and she was definitely you know going before the Lord in prayer. You know, just so she could have my uh, son, and and you know, and that prayer was something that my mom always used to reference every time she was praying for me. Um, so definitely she did see me coming out preaching and, uh, um, definitely, you know, that has been fulfilled, um, in my life today. Right. So can you go into it more? So for you personally, how do you know that you're called to ministry or, uh, and how did you come to faith? Can you, can you expand a little more from the time of your mother and mm -hmm. going on? Well, again, like, it kind of branches out. So I always uh, think about the faith of my mom and then how that played into my own faith. And what for me, when I realized when I went to get into ministry, because it's not like, um, you know, a cakewalk. It's not like, you know, you just wake up one day and it's like, oh, you know, there's ministry. That's what I want to do. Um, I think God walked me through a process of realizing um, what my mandate and purpose was. And um, it came to me, you know, through, you know, just growing up in the church and hearing messages and saying, you know, I really love God. And then that love for God transitioned into what can I do to serve God? And um, when I go, when it transitioned into, okay, how do I serve God? You know, I try to put in the works in terms of what can I do to tell others about God? Um, and then when I figured out that I want to tell other people about God, um, because of this love that was growing in my heart, I think that's when I found uh, my purpose in regards to ministry. And in regards to, you know, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, it, uh, it became um, an overflow of love in my heart for the gospel that became manifestation of the works that I wanted to do um, as a Christian. So uh, are you in church and doing ministry just because you were born into the church and born into a Christian family? Um, no, but I can say it did help me a lot. <laughs> okay, so what caused you to come to faith? What caused me to come to faith um, was an encounter with God. And when a lot of people have different encounters. You know, some people have visions. Some people have dreams. Um, for me, it was um, reading the Bible and just finding out there was an overflow of love, uh, overflow of love within the Bible when it comes to, you know, just reading um, just the sacrifice that Jesus d did on the cross. And, you know, as I got older, you know, when you try to put other religions you know, trying to figure out, okay, you know, this is what Christians believe, but you always have that reference of, you know, I am in a Christian household, so maybe, you know, I'm kind of biased towards it. But if you look at any other type of religion, you know, you don't see a sacrifice that major or that huge uh, that could, you know, redeem man. 
you know, it's always, you know, you have to do these repetitive tasks. But, you know, Jesus Christ is the only reason that actually redeemed man for his sins. And, you know, what we have to do is believe. So I think for me, it's by realization of the scripture and the revelations that the scripture has uh, revealed unto me through reading. Um, that's how I came to Christ. Well, you know that um, for a lot of young people, it's uh, challenging to stand for God. It's challenging to be different than those around them in school, college, and so forth. There's a lot of pressure on, on young people to really fit in. So, uh, but Tarek, what helped you to stand for God as a young man? So over the years, being in the church, your teenage years up to now, what are some of the things that you'd say help you to really stand for the Lord? Um, for me, it does help that I have parents that were Christians. Okay. Um, so that's definitely a, a plus. Um, but I think uh, I've always was taught, like, you know, you have to know God for yourself. You have to know Jesus for yourself. Um, so for me, you know, having a relationship, having a relationship with God was really um, important for me. So I think I think in today's age, it, it's not really um, unpopular to be kind of weird or kind of be kind of different. I think there's um, in today's society, everybody wants to kind of be a part of the majority. But I don't really think that's necessarily the most popular thing to do. I think you have to be able to identify who you are and who you are in Christ. And once you have a firm understanding of who you are in Christ, um, let that firm understanding be the foundation upon you where you walk on. So for me, why I stand was understanding that, you know, if the gospel, the God, Jesus said that I am supposed to be um, a man after his own heart. If it teaches me about righteousness and I'm reading the Bible, I'm seeing how these men of a God who had um, a love for God fell and how they had to keep on going for God and keep on pursuing him. And how I'm reading about David, about, you know, how he has fall from, you know, how he fell with his sin and how he had to, you know, keep on going to God and repent for his sin. I'm reading about, you know, Saul, who was a person who was murdering Christians and how he went and he became Paul, someone who was actually going ahead and, you know, preaching about the gospel. So when you read these scriptures in the Bible, for me, um, you know, I always think testimony is such a powerful term because um, through my mom's testimony, am I able to give my own testimony? And if you think about it, through the testimony of others in the Bible, are we able to draw the strength from their testimonies, understand that we can now, you know, have a way to kind of defeat the kind of majority or the normality of this world. Um, I think a lot of times um, there is a pressure, but that pressure doesn't have to crush us. It can make us into something a lot more beautiful like diamonds. So um, I'm sure you went through different temptations. How, how did you overcome those temptations as a, as a young man? Um, definitely, you know, I could, I think a lot, most young people can say that they have attested some temptations and some people even fall into some temptations. Um, I don't think I'm uh, exclusive to that fact, but I do think what the difference between temptations is, you know, you have to understand that you're always going to be tempted. Jesus was tempted himself. But um, in terms of actually falling through the temptations, that's something completely different. So for me, um, you know, I always think that temptations always start with like a thought. And then it necessarily becomes like a desire. And then you want to fulfill that desire. Um, I think for me, it, one of the things is that, you know, when you do have a thought like that, it's just to cut it off at the thought and just to focus on something else. Uh, you know, it, you have to be able to switch gears you know, kind of like a, a car, you have to be able to switch gears and like, all right, this thought is coming to my mind. This probably is going to lead me to a dark place and I really don't want to do it. So I'm going to go and switch to something else. So you definitely have to switch your mindsets. Okay. Um, all right. So you're going to go on the mission field to Nepal. So can you tell us uh, what type of missions have you done before or have you already been involved in ministry? Uh, yeah, so I've been to um, a total of five countries. I've been to um, Brazil. I've been to um, Argentina, uh, Puerto Rico, um, Jamaica, and the United Kingdom. And um, each one of those places was a different form um, of me just doing ministry in general. So I've I've rec I've been doing a lot of um, first of all, you know, just building up the church in terms of physically actually building up a church like you know oh, where did you do that in jamaica okay. i was um it was like a tent church they had the land and you had to go ahead and actually um put the cement down to help put the cement down help put some bricks down 
And um, now um, I believe it's a, it's a church now that actually has like doors and everything. So it's kind of great to kind of see um, how the transformation was from, you know, just a plot of land with a tent that they had to clean every Sunday to now having like a church that's there. That's, you know, I could actually say I've been a part of that work. And also um, giving back to the community. Um, we did a lot of, you know, giving giving back to the poor in terms of food and in terms of supplies as that well. That was in Jamaica also? Um, it was in Jamaica. It was also in the UK okay. as well. Um, where, you know, we gave some food out and we gave people supplies. Um, I would say in the UK, I would definitely focused on doing a lot of teachings and devotions uh, within the church community there. So I definitely was um, in a position of a teacher and teaching them um, about just going about the some scriptures about the Bible, about, you know, living purity and how to preach out and how to, you know, really minister the gospel effective, which is something that's really important in this today's time. Um, I would say in um, Brazil, um, we did a lot of deliverance ministry there. You know, you have a lot of people that was um, in drugs, um, definitely in Brazil. And we was able to partner up with a ministry there and, um, you know, give out food late at night and being able to see the homeless people that's on the ground and to see, um, you know, the stuff that they struggled with and to be able to, you know, pray with them and, you know, seeing deliverance and seeing people that, you know, were drug addicts, but in the church, you know, seeing their redemptive story of how they met God and how, you know, where they were healed from it and they no longer had to be addicted. So there was a lot of stuff that I learned from Brazil there. So that's some of the, a little bit of taste of what I've been doing in regards to my ministry all around. Well, you also have been preaching. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I can't forget that part. Yeah. I've also been preaching the gospel as well um, on the streets, um, giving out tracts and um, administering to sinners as well. Wait, but you also preach in the church, don't you? Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I preach in the church as well, inside the church and outside the church. The best type of preaching. <laughs> okay. So, uh, they head into Nepal. What will you be doing in Nepal? Uh, in Nepal, I'm going to be there for about approximately 16 months. Um, in Nepal, I do, um, I'm do. i searching for avenues and rich to uh, do ministry in. Um, Nepal is one of those countries where you can't really minister as freely as you would other countries that I've been to, like in, um, you know, Jamaica or the or United Kingdom, um, you know, they very much are against evangelism and um, will most definitely put you in jail up to five to seven years if you are caught or someone does report you to the Nepalese government. Um, so it's a lot different than other works that I've been doing. So it's really um, focusing on a friendship evangelism and being able to uh, partner up with different communities. Um, so we're going to be partnering up with a disabled community, um, you know, with them. And within their government, which in the culture is a lot different than American culture. So people who are disabled or people who are poor are looked down upon um, because, you know, they're not born into this kind of caste system where, you know, the caste system, you know, you have the highest of the highs who are, you know, the people that kind of, you know, run the government so and have they're money. Hindus, yeah? yeah, they're mostly Hindus, you know. Okay. Um, I would say uh, 90% is Hindus and then the 10% is Buddhists. And like Hindus and Buddhists have this weird relationship where it's like, you know, they kind of believe they in many gods. Right? 1%. Okay. Okay. 1% are Christians um, in a population. And um, if they are Christians, they're mostly underground and they don't practice. It's not like they have like a church, you know, because they have a whole bunch of temples and shrines in uh, Nepal, but you know, you're not gonna see a church out there, there with a, a lot cross. Of churches. There are a lot of, if they do have churches that they're underground. They're not being uh they're like have like a house church, I would say. Okay. So it's definitely something um that God's working on me to do. Okay, so um all right, so okay. I th- you also mentioned that you you're gonna be going to a certain group of people who have not really heard the gospel before. Um, yes, the, it's the the Nepalese people, um, Mm -hmm. you know, they haven't really heard the gospel because of exactly of the conditions of the government. Mm -hmm. Um, so like how I was explaining, like the lower caste systems and everything like that, Mm -hmm. um, the caste systems, um, you know, really, really are something that's followed in the India as well, where, you know, you do have a higher class and a lower class. And some of these people have never heard of the term Jesus because, again, like, you know, they're poor, don't have access to like social media. They don't have access um, to understand of the Bible because the government, you know, doesn't want the Bible circulated in their country. Um, So you definitely have like a group of people that, you know, have been cut off uh, from a lot of large ports, uh, large portions of the world. And, you know, you're just trying to give out 
the truth of Jesus Christ to those people. All right. Praise God. So, all right, Tarek. So any advice you have for young people who may desire to be in ministry, or even maybe you could say something to those who probably have no desire to be in ministry, and what would you say to them to kind of like ignite that that desire uh, to do the work of the Lord and to get into ministry? And there may be some listening who want to get into ministry. Maybe they don't know how to start. What would you say to them? I would say uh, you should just, for those who want to, you should just start. Um, and when I say start, you know, just do whatever you can. Um, you know, and that sounds like a jump, but you have to realize what's your mandate and what's your purpose. Um, you know, what, were you, what did God put you on this earth to do? I think that's a question that, you know, I pondered about a lot when I first went to ministry. And I think um, the manifestations of that will show and the works that you do. Um, so, you know, you do hear that, you know, in the Bible, you know, the Bible does command us to love each other. You know, what does that really look like? And um, if the gospel commands us to share the gospel with other people as of the Great Commission that's found in um, Matt, in the book of Matthew, you know, what do we as Christians, how does that look like for us to do? So I would just get started on getting focused on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and um, let that be your starting point and, you know, see what God is putting on your heart and your spirit to do. Okay, so what about... Uh, uh, young people out there who have no desire for ministry at all. They just want to do their career and just get on with life. I mean, I, I feel like as long as you're a Christian, you know, there will always be a desire for more. And um, when I say that, it's, it's more like, you know, as a Christian, you're practicing um, having a relationship with Jesus, you know, having a relationship with God. Um, and I think a lot of times we we misclassify um, you know, being Christians as just saying, you know, I just go to a church, you know, and um, it's okay because I go to a church. It's so much more than just going to church. It's having a personal relationship with your Lord and Savior. It's understanding um, about the power that you have as a Christian. You know, you can't, you know, necessarily be called a Christian if you, you know, you never talk to Jesus. You know, you never talk to Christ. Um, so I, I think you have to look for more ways to be interactive with Jesus. I feel like prayer is one of the things that, you know, Christians who are may, may not be interested in ministry, um, they should at least be in deep communication with Jesus and let um, Jesus reveal to them what needs to be done um, in their lives and what their purpose and what their mandate is. Because most of the times we think that our um, vocation is our mandate or, you know, is our purpose, you know, but you will find out, you know, um, really soon that, you know, your vocation cannot fill um that spiritual hole that you have in your heart, you know, your job or money doesn't really fill it in because that's all of the flesh. You have to have something that has that brings purpose. All right. So um, after all you've said, I'm a little jealous here. Uh, is only your mom's testimony affected you? That, nothing from your father right here? Uh, yeah, definitely. You know? <laughs> all right. <laughs> so... Uh, so, Tarek, any questions you have for me? Um, yeah, you know, I think it's really important that um, people realize um, the, the significance or uh, kind of what culture has done for social media and how that social media has affected the church. Um, you know, we live in, in today's age where you have um, at least, you know, a lot of people that are quote unquote Christian influencers and Christian influencers, meaning like, you know, they have social media platform in which they, you know, be able to share about their faith. Um, I think that, you know, in a lot of portions that have really affected a lot of young people that do follow these, you know, influencers for encouragement or, you know, to see their posts. But now you have being these same influencers um, being people that are actually, you know, renouncing Christ. You had like two of them this year that actually renounced Christ. Um, so I think what role should social media play in the church and how does the culture of social media um, affects how we evangelize? So you're saying, so what role should social media play in the church? Yeah. So, I mean, social media is just like the internet platform or TV platform in terms of how the church should engage it. So what I mean by that is these platforms can do a lot of good and a lot of evil. Uh, the internet TV was like that. The internet is like that. There's a lot of good and a lot of evil on it. And social media uh, kind of is the pinnacle of all the good and all the bad that can happen on the internet. Uh, on social media, you have a lot of good. In social media, you have 
the worst kind of evil. And, and for some reason, when people engage social media, sometimes the worst part of them come out that you wouldn't see face to face or in another type of forum. So in terms of how should the church uh, use social media or what role should the church play in social media, it's just like how the church has been used in TV, internet. It's another media platform for the church to spread its message. So the church basically should take the message of the gospel through social media, and that can take different kind of forms. And we're we going to go into all the different ways, uh, the correct and the, the correct way, the best way to go about it. But the fact is that the church today has to get involved in social media. You know, Sundays, Sunday is only one day, and most churches have Sunday services, maybe one day in the week. And then there's all this gap in between. And in the past, you know, it just be that the church door would be closed until next time when the church doors are open. And now today with social media, what the church has to understand is that we cannot have that gap. And what I mean by that is the moment people step outside of church, they're on their phones, they're on their computers, and they're interacting with social media all the time. And that's both young and old. And so it's very important that the church presence is on these platforms so that people can continue to interact with the message, uh, continue to interact with the, the life of the church through social media platforms. Things like the pastor could give a message there. The services can be on there uh, throughout the week. Different ways uh, social media can be used to interact with people so that the people keep in mind the things of God. There's so much, so much information being dumped into social media that it's very necessary for the church's presence to be there. Now, in terms of individuals, that's, I'm talking about the church as a body, things that leaders, pastors can do, church bodies can do to get on social media in different ways. You have live services, you can have interactive posts, you can have a pastor or church leader just coming on and sharing something uh, from their life through that week. So you have these different types of uh, way that they can interact, uh, uh, sharing pictures from the church, from missions, from ministry, and things of that sort. But in terms of individuals, how individuals should interact with social media, it's, it's number one, it's very important that everyone, every believer, be very vigilant and careful the type of people that they listen to on social media. Every believer need to first understand that it's the, it's the, their local church. That's the primary place where they should be getting uh, fed in the word, taught in the word, uh, advice, spiritual advice and counsel. Local church is the first place, not the internet, not social media. You got to look at, you know, ministry through the internet with social media as a supplemental thing, you know, like reading a good Christian book, yeah, but not as the main way that they should be fed or the main way that they should be led. There should be a local church with a local pastor, leader. It's still important to touch, you know, to have the physical presence. It's, it's, it's very important when the Bible talks about fellowship it's not talking about just, you know, writing letters. Back then, it would be writing letters. Yeah, it definitely would have been. Right. Today is social media. Back then, it would be writing letters. But, I mean, when Paul talked about fellowship or the apostles talk about fellowship, they're not talking about writing letters to each other. They're talking about being, actually being together. Uh, I, where the scripture says where two or three are gathered together, it, it's talking about a physical gathering. And how do I know that? Because, well, communion it, it, it communion where they share the meal together. It was done physically there at a location where they are actually together. When they talk about greeting each other with a kiss, you can only do that if your physical presence is actually there. And so it's still important to gather together in a local place to have a pastor over you who can hold you accountable and it could teach you uh, as you go through different things in life. So I'm saying to know the place that social media plays. It should not replace the church. Mm -hmm. It should not replace the local gathering. It should not replace a pastor, but it can be used supplementally. Mm -hmm. the, uh, and to be very vigilant in who you listen to. You can go to your pastor for advice of whether a certain person is good or not. Uh, you could do your own research on them to see what are the type of doctrines that they teach. 
to help guide you in that. Now, if you don't know how to do the research, ask a pastor, ask a leader in your church, ask a mature person in your church for some help in that area. Now, the other thing is how we use social media as individuals. You know, you have Christians that goes on, say, for example, Facebook, and they talk about other people in their church. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that definitely happens. Or talk about their church, or negative things about their church. I, I'm not talking about, like, the, there's false doctrine in the church. I'm talking about, like, something happened, like offenses happen every day, and they go and spread it all over online, or there's some kind of scandal, and they just, like, talk yeah. about it all the church, and it's just, like, it looks bad as Christians for us to have things like that. That's definitely not the way uh, we want to use social media. You don't want to use social media to kind of like just bear out all the negative things going on in the church or even in our lives as Christians. Some things should be kept off of it. We definitely want to use social media to encourage others, to build others up in Christ, you know, to, to share good things, positive things. And it is not the place definitely to air out negatives about the church. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree. So that in terms of how we use social media on a personal level, and of course, we can find interesting ways to engage people to share the gospel on social media. So so that's answering the first question you asked, which is uh, what role social media play with the church? Mm. So I and mean, I hopefully I answered all of that. Is there anything? Yeah, no, you definitely answered all of it. So the next part, the next part is... Uh, how social media have have affected the church, and I, I think I touched on that also already. Yeah, you did. Because a social uh, influencer, you know, like with uh, Christian uh, influencers, you know, that's uh, you know kind of like a new term in the last like you know couple of years, yeah. where you have you know Christians, um, you know, who are pivotal in like the Christian community. I would say, uh, you know, who young people listen to like you know like maybe like a, a musical artist, for example. Um, may have a certain sway over a Christian audience because, you know, that's the type of music they listen to. Um, not to say that like, a pastor doesn't, but, you know, a lot of times you have a lot of these, uh, you know, influencers in the world um, that are Christians. Um, and then what the thing is, people are looking to them to kind of guide them, kind of like they're becoming like kind of pseudo pastors. Yeah, they're but, like you know, fans. Yeah. So, right. And, and that's why I stress the fact that Having a local church, the local pastor, that should be our primary uh, place of receiving spiritual growth. That's not to say we cannot have someone online, social media that we look up to, we learn from, and can influence us. But should not don't let that be the primary thing. Don't let that be the primary thing that's uh, guiding your spiritual life. It should be supplementary, like I said, like a good book, um, and that will help with that. Now. You know, I I believe Christian influencers, as you call them, uh, should be very careful in the way they use that platform God has given them. So, for example, if you're not a pastor um, and you are just uh, your worship leader or just just a, a Christian brother or sister, and you have a social media and you're you're sharing things about the Lord, that's that's well good and fine. Um, nothing is wrong with that, but don't become don't don't try to be a the pastor on the social media. You know, help to lead people back to their their pastors. Deal with the areas that the Lord has given you to deal with, without trying to step over the line. And here's here's the other thing: if you don't know about the topic, don't address it. And I, I find that a lot of um, Christians on social media they just spew their mind. On anything that's a spew your opinion. If you don't know what the scriptures, what God says about a topic, it's best not to say anything and just to spew off your opinions. So to, to be good stewards of what God has given you. If God has given you a platform on social media where people are listening to you and you're influencing people, then you want to be careful what you say. If you don't know what the Bible says about homosexuality, why are you talking about it? Well, we know homosexuality is a sin. Yeah, but definitely. then you have some of these Christian influencers that they're not really sure what the Bible says, and then maybe someone asks them a question, or maybe they see uh, 
a preacher preaches against homosexuality and they give their opinion. They say, well, we should just all love each other yeah, and I don't well. see what's wrong. Um, well, maybe you don't see what's wrong because you don't know what the scriptures say. And, and my point is, when it comes to, since you are influenced and you're a believer, when it comes to the things of the word, if you're not sure, you say, you know what? Yeah, I'm really not sure. My pastor says it's wrong. My church says it's wrong. I'm going to you know, find out a little more and come back before I say something about it. See what the Bible says about it uh, before you make an opinion. And, and, and if you're struggling in your faith, you're ready to leave your faith. Maybe do not tell that to everybody. <laughs> maybe go and talk to your pastor, talk to a church leader, discuss that. Um, and, you know, one of the craziest things that's happening that these um, – Christian influencers or so-called influencers who decide to leave the faith, they're also saying that publicly. So the, the people that are following them may be affected by what they are actually saying. And, and that becomes um, an issue that becomes a, a problem right there. So I, I would say, though, if you have struggles in your, in your life, deal with it with a pastor. Not everything should be on Social media, not everything should be public. Sometimes take off a time, talk to your pastor, let them hold you accountable, uh, let them deal with you in any way it needs to be dealt with to overcome that issue that may be there. Praise God. So those are just a, just a few a few pointers. Um, one of the things I definitely think is happening also is social media and its effect on the church or effect on the body of Christ that there's so much information, that there's a lot of nonsense, I should say, where people are are following um, yeah, uh, uh, controversial things, conspiracy theories uh, about, you know, maybe the, the, the current president is the Antichrist. I mean, like weird stuff. Yeah, because Obama was the Antichrist. We, we all know that. <laughs> right. It was a weird <laughs> stuff, like a Planet X and, you know, aliens coming and, I mean, stuff that is you can't you can't find it in the scriptures. No, and we got to keep in mind whatever information we're hearing to filter that information through the Word of God. That's what it comes back to. And if you're not sure what the Word of God says, that's why you have to have a local church. So, hope that answers your question, Tarek. Any more? Uh nah. You know, kids uh, read your Bible. Oh, kids read your Bible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Uh, I hope this is an encouragement to those that are listening, um, to any young person out there. Um, just as you see, my son Tarek has gone out into ministry, um, that God can do the same in your life. I also started ministry at a young age. God can speak to you. God can speak to you. He can show you what his purpose is for your life. And parents that are listening, encourage your children to go forth into ministry. And please place Tarek in your prayers as he's getting ready to go to Nepal. Uh, keep him in your prayers. Pray for him that the ministry will be effective, that he'll be under God's protection. Um, so, Tarek, if anyone wants to donate toward as you're there on the mission field over the next uh, year and a half or so, uh, what do they do? Where do they go? Well, uh, this is what you could do is go to Bethany International. That's uh, Bethany International, B-E-T-H-A-N-Y International. And um, we're basically a website that's called Gateways. That's, that's .edu? Um, yes, it is .edu. Bethany International .edu? Yes. Okay. I could just double check that. All right. So they go to Bethany International and and then what? Um, you would look for my name. Oh, so that's so that's BethanyInternational.org. So it's um, let me just t- it's give dot BethanyInternational.org. Okay. And when they go to that site, or you can just go to BethanyInternational.org, and when you go to that site, you can basically click on the search, uh, for a uh, missionaries. Okay. So there's a search of missionaries there. Yep, and, and you'll type in my name, which starts with a T E R R I Q U E. T E R R I Q U E. Yeah. So like literally, when you go on the page, you're gonna go. Um, 
Then you go to bethanyinternational.org. Yep. Then you go to missions. Yep. You, you click on the missions, and mm-hmm. then you click on give, give to, to a missionary. Mis- give to a missionary. Okay, I see. And when you do click, uh, when you go to that, you're gonna say fund a missionary. Fund a missionary. Or you can say um, fund a global intern. Okay, so you want to go to fund a missionary, correct? Um, I believe you want to go to fund a global intern because I'm okay. still a global intern. Okay, fund a global intern. And then you're going to put... I put the name of the person in. Yep. All right. And there'll, there'll be a, a link on our Facebook page about this so that you can donate. So you go to bethanyinternational.org, go to missions, fund a missionary, and... uh and you can put in the name there. You can look up for Tarek's name. It's T-E-R-R-I-Q-U-E, Tarek. Yeah. And you could fund there. And the link also will be on our Facebook page uh, and along with this post. All right, so God bless you. Um, again, pray for Tarek. And believe God, parents, that your children can go into 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 ministry and even go on, on mission trips. That's one way to do it is to take your children out on mission trips. Uh, we didn't mention that. Uh, actually, Tarek went on mission trips with my wife uh, and has been in ministry with us uh, as, a, as a pastor of church, churches. Tarek has been right there helping along in the ministry. And so get your children involved in doing ministry. Get your children involved in, in ministry activities and inspire them to do the work of the Lord. God bless you. Tune in again next time on the next episode of Arrows of Revival. Remember, you could send an email at hello at revivalarrows.com or you could go to our website, revivalarrows.com. God bless you. Thank you again for talking to us today, Terry. Anytime. And uh, just go to the link. Don't, you know, just go to the link. (laughs) Thank you for listening (laughs) to Arrows of Revival. To hear other episodes, go to revivalarrows.com. Again, our website is revivalarrows.com. To contact us, email hello at revivalarrows.com. Send us an email to hello at revivalarrows.com. And remember, let God shape you and polish you as an arrow for his revival.